Hey everybody, uh, my name is Tim with the Mariners Museum. Welcome to our program for today uh, about the Battle of New Orleans. Um, before we start, just wanna let you all know about a couple of upcoming events. Um, our next couple of events are a little bit different. Um, on July 20th, we're gonna have the naming legacies from the Battle of Iwo Jima with Mark Newcup. Um, it's gonna be about uh, ships and such that were named after things that happened uh, from that battle. Uh, and oh. then on July 23rd, we're also going to have a naming legacies of the Battle of Okinawa. Um, and those two programs are uh, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of those events. Uh, our next uh, JVQ event is going to be on August 10th at noon. Uh, and that's going to be about the USS Mississippi, um, which is pretty cool. That was uh, Matt Perry's ship that helped open up uh, Japan. Um, so, uh, like always, if you could like and subscribe, share, uh, that stuff really does help us out and get our message out and um, grow our audience. So, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to John. Hello, everyone. And uh, I'm John Corsini, of course, uh, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum. And today, we're going to complete our story that we talked about the other week, which was the Battle of the Head of the Passes. Um, that was a very important engagement because the federal leadership was very, very bad. Now, why do the federals want to be able to capture New Orleans? Well, if you look at the map, uh, you can see how the Delta then becomes, uh, when those passes come together, that is the Head of the Passes. And then you go up 40 miles and you have these two forts that I'll go into more detail that are defending New Orleans. Then Can you share your screen, John? Pardon? Can you share your screen? That way we can see your slides. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so here's the map. Um, and uh, so 40 miles up from the head of the passes is where Fort St. Philip, Fort Jackson happened to be, and then 80 miles up will be the largest city in the south. It is uh, known as New Orleans. Here's a nice view of New Orleans. What made New Orleans so important? It was a leading shipping, a leading uh, shipbuilding center, and also an industrial center. So those are resources that the Confederacy desperately needs. Added to that, they are the choke point for any commerce coming down the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, and the main part of the Mississippi River. So this clogs union, the union's ability to get their goods out to sea. So New Orleans is something the Confederates really need to hold. However, there were some problems. And the problem was most people thought the Federals are going to attack New Orleans from the upper river coming down. And so because of the battles like Shiloh, um, you know, Island number 10, uh, they start to remove resources and troops away from New Orleans. <coughs> to defend those upper reaches. Now, I got to tell you, many people, such as the commander of the Confederate forces defending New Orleans, Major General um, Mansfield Lovell. Uh, Lovell is a West Pointer, of course, and a brilliant engineer. And his counterpart with the Navy is Flag Officer uh, George Holland. You might remember from last week, he commanded the attack against the head of the passes. So this city must be saved in every way it could. And Mansfield is fighting against the removal of all these troops. Uh, you know, uh, he, he was a brilliant horseman. And um, so because of those things, uh, he, he would ride around New Orleans and goes, oh, wow. But they didn't realize or recognize that that threat was building below um, the river. Now, how are we going to defend New Orleans? Well, George Hollins is going to advocate that the Confederates take their ships down to the head of the passes. So when 
the Union try to cross, they have to lighten their ships and then they could be attacked. This is one of the ironclads that's being built in New Orleans. It is really kind of amazing ship uh, because, and this is not an accurate view of it, I have to say, it, it has exposed ends uh, and actually the smokestack's not there, but further back on the vessels, but it was powered with two seven inch Brook rifles, four eight inch Dahlgrens, three nine inch Dahlgrens and seven 30 shell guns. It's 264 feet in length. It was launched in January of 1862. However, its motive power didn't meet the expectations of the designer. Um, and so basically the ship has two center paddle wheels, right? And so unfortunately they're set in row. Uh, so they create eddies and they work against each other so that you don't have enough support to be able to move the rudders. Well, the idea was we're gonna have two screw propellers. Uh, and the trouble is those engines are not working as the threat uh, will come. And so Louisiana will feature in the battle uh, that we're gonna talk about. Actually, the battle is called the Battle of Fort St. Philip and Fort Jackson. So um, what's gonna happen is that the Confederates are also building the CSS Mississippi, which is an even more powerful looking vessel. Uh, however, they have to make a special um, um, drivetrain for it and it has to come from Richmond and it's not sent from Richmond until uh, April 23rd. And so we all know that means the Mississippi is not going to be operational. Now, the big trouble with the Confederate's defense is going to be that it's going to be in actually three commands, the Confederate Navy, the Louisiana State Navy, which had the Governor Moore and General Quitman, and then there was the River Defense Fleet. Now, you all remember about Captain John Stevenson from the other week. He's the guy that built the Manassas and the Confederate Navy took it from him. So Lovell tells all these different forces they have to follow the leadership of a man known as a flag officer, John Mitchell. Now Mitchell becomes commander of the Naval Forces because in Richmond, they got so tired of listening to Hollins's complaint, they send him back to Richmond and they put uh, William C. Whittle, who was commander of the New Orleans Navy Yard, in command of everything. Well, he says it's too much for him, so that's where John Mitchell will take command. But Stevenson refused to follow the orders of the uh, John K. Mitchell, so there's going to be nothing but confusion when the moment of attack comes. Now, added to this, the real main defenses are going to be 80 miles below New Orleans at a big bend in the river and there, Fort St. Philip and Fort Jackson. They feature 177 cannons, believe it or not. Fort St. Philip is rather famous. It was built as Fort San Philippe uh, by the Spanish during their time in occupying uh, Louisiana. And so the when United States acquires Louisiana, we rebuild the fort. Actually was able to block the British fleet from coming up the Mississippi to support the British during the Battle of New Orleans. And the trouble is techniques or, or warfare, naval warfare, is bombarded until it surrenders. And unfortunately, uh, brick forts are better than wooden ships. And so the, the British have a nine-day siege in 1815, and they're forced back down the river. Oh, my gosh. This is... Really, you can see the two forts, how they're located. Fort St. Philip is up to your right. Down below is Fort Jackson. Now, 
Fort Jackson is going to be named for, of course, General Andrew Jackson, who defended New Orleans during the War of 1812. Uh, it was started in 1822 and completed in 1832. It is what is called a star fort. And there is actually the engineer's plans for Fort Jackson. And you can see it has its bastions out of work. They also have a water battery that is not in this plan because it's gonna be added later. Now, it's commanded by Brigadier General Johnson Kelly uh, Duncan. And he is an 1849 graduate of West. Uh, he was an engineer. Uh, he was born in New York, but he started to work in Louisiana uh, after he resigned from the army and was an engineer and became really pro South. So now you got to remember these forts are located 40 miles up from the head of the passes. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about the failure head of the passes. So Gideon Wells is going to reorganize uh, the Gulf blockading squadron, dividing it in two. One's going to be the East Coast blockading squadron, and the other is going to be the West Gulf blockading squadron. And the man they select for command of the West Gulf blockading squadron is going to be this man, David Glasgow Farragut. And, you know, he almost didn't get to be in command, primarily because um, when the war, you know, he was born in Tennessee. His family was from Norfolk. He lived in Norfolk. However, when the secession crisis erupted, he moves to New York with his family. And so they're wondering, how loyal is Farragut? So his foster brother, David Dixon Porter, goes meets with uh, Farragut and says, uh, you know, uh, are, are you truly loyal? And Farragut says, of course I am. I'm here to defend the flag. What if we sent you to attack Norfolk? Would you take that assignment? And Farragut first says, well, you know, I'd rather not. I got family there, no many people, so I'd rather not. And David Dixon Porter says, well, you are not the man I thought you were. And Farragut replies, do not trifle with me, David. I will take Norfolk and I'll even burn it if I need to. Whoa, so they say, okay, you're the man. But they put him in charge of this great expedition that is to capture New Orleans. He is going to be supported uh, by uh, Benjamin Franklin Butler. And we've already talked about him before. Uh, he is a shyster, you know, lawyer and trickster politician from Massachusetts. He has command of an 18,000-man force, uh, which has been given to him by then General-in-Chief um, George Britton McClellan. So what's going to happen is that Farragut takes on this job. He knows, number one, that because of what Samuel Francis DuPont did at Port Royal Sound, using his steamships in a circle, they were able to reduce the two brick forts of Fort Walker and Beauregard at the entrance to Port Royal Sound. So he knows he's got steam and he is going to be able just to rush past those forts, especially if he goes at night. So, and once he got above um, those forts, there was nothing to stop him. Now, it just so happens that his foster brother, David Dixon Porter, was a really slickster. You know, he tried to ingratiate himself with Gideon Wells and Gustavus Vasa Fox. And so he was given a semi-independent command, uh, it, written as 20 or 21 uh, mortar scho schooners with support ships. Each of these mounted a 13-inch sea mortar that was actually on a traversing mount. So um, he actually orders the mortars and facilitates their construction at Fort Pitt, arsenal in, or foundry in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He even orders 30,000 explosive shells. He says, look, I'm going to be able to blow those forts 
into dust. And Farragut said, well, I'm not so sure you'll do that. But Porter bragged to everyone he would defeat the forts in 48 hours. So Farragut begins assembling his fleet off of Ships Island, which is in the Mississippi Sound, off the entrance to uh, the um, uh, two passes they're going to use to go into the Mississippi River. Um, he's there on uh, February 18th, 1862. Uh, then he begins to move his ships into the river. Now the mortar schooners and the lighter draft gunboats go up the pass to the old tree. However, he has got to take the pass uh, which is known as the Southwest Pass. And it's supposed to have 18 inches of water over its sandbar at the entrance, but it actually just has 15 inches. So he's got these heavy sloops of war, steam powered or screw sloops of war, the Pensacola, the Hartford, the Richmond, the Brooklyn, the Mississippi, which is a paddler, and then a screw steam frigate, the Colorado. Well, every one of them has a greater draft. So how they get through is they ram into the uh, sandbar, creating indentation back up and ram again, slowly but surely. And you know, they start doing this on March 18th. Slowly but surely, he gets his ships across. The paddler, um, Mississippi, is one of the key ships to get across. In fact, when it crosses the bar, Farragut says, now we're all right. Uh, he then sent the U.S. Coastal Survey to set up ranges for both the mortar ships and how those defenses uh, appear to be able to have covering fire. So he's all ready to get his, his fleet going. The trouble is he's got to wait for David Dixon Porter to begin his mortar bombardment, which begins on April 18th. Meanwhile, Farragut gets his ships all ready. They put sandbags around all their machinery. They actually lay or drop anchor chains along the sides of their ships. And he divides his squadron into three divisions. The Red Squadron, commanded by Captain Bailey, uh, which is going to feature Boats like the uh, Steam Screw Sloop, the Pensacola, and of course the Paddler Mississippi and other gunboats. Division two, which is called Blue, the first is red, second is blue, and it is going to be uh, commanded by Farragut himself and features three Steam Screw Sloops, the Hartford, Brooklyn, and Richmond. And then commanded by Henry Bell, Captain Henry Bell will be the red and blue squadron, which is supposed to follow as the um, Union moves through the chain barrier. One of the big things that the veterans have is a chain barrier across the Mississippi. And that is a real, you know, because you can't ram your ships through there. As you're doing that, you're sitting duck for the coastal defense forts. Well, I got to tell you that the mortar squadron begin their bombardment at 9 a.m. on April 18th. The schooners were camouflaged by trees. They also put branches up in their mass. So on the first day, 1,400 shells were lobbed into the forts um, on the first day of the bombardment. General Duncan will say that the constant shelling, um, and I gotta tell you, a mortar round was fired every two minutes, um, caused minimal damage to the forts, knocking out a couple of guns. However, many of the shells exploded in the air or ended up dumping into the mud uh, and exploding harmlessly. So uh, the barracks were burned, several other buildings, the shot, the hot shot furnace is going to be destroyed. However, I have to say the biggest impact is on the is on the, the defenders themselves. This constant sound of cannonading is just a great deal to maintain your morale. By uh, April 20th, Farragut says, look, you're not doing very good. And, and actually, Porter says on April 
uh, 23rd, give me another two days. And Farragut says, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to test how effective you are. I'm going to send my signal officer, Osborne, up into the mass of the Hartford, and he'll raise a white flag if there's a miss and a red flag if they're a hit. Well, it's five to one misses versus hits. Farragut says, well, you know, you've had your chance. I'm going to run past those forts. Now, I have to tell you that they've already gone up and have broken a section of the chain. In fact, the Confederates don't realize they're doing it until too late. Um, and they'll, the two gunboats, uh, the Saka and the Pino, will be bombarded, but it's too late. This big gap in the chain boom, which is supported by old hulks. And so with that break, those Union ships can go through. At 2 a.m. on the morning of 24 August, Farragut's flagship, the Hartford, launched, stop, puts up two red lanterns, which is said, that's when we're going to go through. And so by 3.30, the first ship, the Cuyahoga, made through the gap of the chains. The Confederates don't even see the Union ships going up river until the next ship, the Pensacola, enters in. The Confederates light bonfires to light up the river. They send up rockets or flares to even more light up the river. They prepare their fire rafts to block the Federal entrance. Well, I got to tell you, um, uh, when the um, Farragut's division uh, begins to come through. The Richmond will come within hailing distance of Fort Jackson. The cannon raked the sloop badly. This caused the warship to veer across the river and where it would be hit by heavy shot from Fort St. Philip. Other Union ships were struck several times by Confederate cannon fire. <coughs> Excuse me. As shells decimate gun crews, Hideous screams, groans, and shrieks filled the air. The CSS Louisiana, which has now been brought down and anchored next to Fort Jackson. The trouble is, it's in command of a man known as uh, Charles McIntosh, but Flag Officer Mitchell is on board as well. And so they, the trouble is they could only bear their port and starboard guns against the movement of the Union fleet. This made it very difficult as well because the gun ports had been improperly constructed. So you had very limited range of fire. Well, you know, they only get off about 16 shots from the Louisiana uh, as those federal ships come by. We do know that three shells from the Louisiana um, are going to go right through the Brooklyn. And uh, it seems like that's all the Louisiana can do. However, the Hartford will run aground near Fort St. Philip and the Confederates, the CSS Moser, will bring a fire raft and pull it right up next to the Hartford. The Hartford is engulfed in flames. All seems to be lost until Farragut orders uh, his gun crew of the pivot gun sink that tug and they blow the tug out of the water. While all this is going on, uh, two shells destroy the Moser. All this going on, uh, the CSS Governor Moore will track down the Verona and will actually ram it and will then come back up and ram it again. That second ram, they'll fire down into the um, um, in, into the uh, um, Verona and sink it. Uh, it is amazing. This is a picture of the USS Mississippi. This shows you where the uh, mortar boats are located. And um, so they are over here. And this is where the Louisiana ends up. Of course, Fort uh, Jackson, Fort St. Philip. Uh, so uh, um, this is uh, 
Johnson Kelly Duncan, commander of the forts. Um, now this so you can see is the confusion that's happening with all these ships. Um, you get to see kind of in the middle where the Governor Moore is ramming the uh, Verena, Verana, and uh, here is where the Mississippi, right? I mean, I got to tell you, the Confederate gunboats do not do well. The McRae was struck by grape shop and canister by the USS Illinois and knocked out of action. The ironclad M Manassas will try to ram the Cuyahoga and the Pensacola. It missed those ships. Those ships, of course, go eight knots. The Mississippi on a good day going down river might make six knots. So it then took a course at the Mississippi because the Mississippi, uh, of course, had those exposed um, exposed paddlers, uh, side wheelers. And so um, Lieutenant Warley will move right towards the Mississippi. Just so happens that Lieutenant George Dewey of um, the... Uh, uh, that shows the Governor Moore destroying uh, the Verona. Uh, and I got to tell you, there is uh, Lieutenant George Dewey. And he's at the wheel. He sees that monster. Just remember the scene is eerie by the bonfires, the smoke from the guns, uh, the uh, a flare shooting up and the gunfire. This is a... Uh, you know, an, an amazing scene. So Dewey sees the Manassas heading straight for him. So he turns his ship slightly so that the Manassas misses the paddler, but then scrapes alongside the Mississippi and um, glanced off the Mississippi. Well, Dewey looked down and he saw that the ram had taken all the planking down and all he saw were the gleaming bolt heads. Uh, so the Mississippi missed. So the Mississippi um, will then decides, um, and I think he says those copper uh, bolts were cut as clean as if they were hair under a razor's edge. The Manassas then tries to ram the uh, Hartford, but misses, but Warley, commander of the Manassas, will be able to steer towards the Brooklyn as it passed through the chain barrier and it ran the uh, Brooklyn with such a fierce, um, such a fierce blow that uh, um, there's a huge hole. The only thing that protects the Brooklyn happens to be the chains, anchor chains that are dropped to the side, but it did make a leak in the Brooklyn and then Remember, the Manassas has a one gun, one shot made especially for when you're ramming a ship. So they send a 32 pounder explosive shell through the Brooklyn. It explodes in the sandbags, protecting the uh, uh, machinery of the Brooklyn. So it's like the Brooklyn barely missed it. So the Manassas uh, will then... Uh, actually slide off the sloop and then tried to turn around to go up river. Now the Manassas is, uh, doesn't have the power and actually um, it just so happens that, that um, it just so happens that for um, um, the Mississippi is yelled at or shouted to by uh, Farragut Think that rascally rebel ram. And so Dewey you know, stops one engine, puts forward the other so that one paddler stops. The other one turns it almost on a dime and it chases down the Manassas. I have to tell you, it will, the Manassas will be forced to run aground. And while that happens, Dewey says, we filled her full of shot so the vessel had new portholes, okay? The Mississippi is set afire by her crew, and then she slips off the riverbank, floats down through the federal fleet, 
and basically will explode right in front of the mortar fleet. And by this time, 13 of the 17 um, ships in Farragut's uh, command will have passed through the barrier. And consequently, um, the other ships, um, and remember he begins his attack with 17 ships. Uh, one is sunk and two, because of sunlight is coming, don't think they should run past the fort. And I have to tell you, the fall of New Orleans is devastating. This is one of my favorite scenes of the battle. Now remember, this battle is between 3.30 in the morning and till dawn. And so you can just see from the burning ships, the center ship is a Hartford with, a, with the uh, flame raft next to it. Um, and uh, you can pick out a couple of the other ships. Uh, nevertheless, you can see that this turning a Pasquin's Bend is difficult, but the Federals are able to do it. Once they're passed, there is the next stop is New Orleans. This slide of it is a little larger. You could see the Federal ships when they show up. The citizens of New Orleans said we were or the mayor of New Orleans says we were forced to surrender uh, by overwhelming alien forces, you know, and actually uh, it takes time for Butler to catch up with his ships, uh, with his transports. Uh, Fort uh, Jackson and Fort uh, St. Philip will surrender um, three days later. Louisiana is blown up. The Mississippi is launched and then blown up because they didn't have a tug available to move her back up river. And so Farragut, by his victory here at the Battle of Fort St. Philip and Fort Jackson, uh, will become a hero. Uh, he will be promoted to Rear Admiral, the first Rear Admiral in the United States Navy and the Union capture because of what Farragut did, his boldness, his drive, his strategic and tactical abilities gave him this victory. And the South, New Orleans was devastating for the Confederacy. Um, as I said, the city is a, a critical industrial center um, and, uh, and it was key to the control of the Mississippi River. The loss of New Orleans helped to seal the fate of, of the Confederacy. You have any questions? Uh, yeah, it looks like, um, let's see here. Um, did the CSS Manassas have a system to run hot water down its sides to repel borders? Yes, it did. I explained that last week um, because it is this turtle back. Some people called it a whale, um, but uh, you know, it had a ladder to get up into the hatches. The fear was a larger ship would try to board the Manassas, but from their boilers, they could send scalding steam against anyone who tried to get on its deck. And it was, uh, it was never put to the test. Uh, it's odd because this, this when, when the Monitor fought the CSS Virginia, one of its crew members, he must have been around 80 years old, said, oh, we were ready to blow steam into the Virginia, but they didn't. So there was a way to try and defend a ironclad that usually would have to be fighting a taller ship. Um, so yes, it had that steam system. So, so it had its ram, it had a 32 pounder gun, and then the steam system. So, and went on a good day, six knots. Uh, you know, I want to remind you all last week, someone asked me a question and I drew it blank about Enoch Train, which the Manassas was made on top of its hull. The Enoch, Enoch Train was one of the leading um, um, ship owners in the North. He actually had his own line um, that consisted of several ships known as the White Diamond Line. Um, and it had the cotton trade between New York and Boston to, of course, the Baltic. And that's pretty awesome. He met with Donald McKay, the designer of the great 
clipper ships that had the trade to China. Actually, Enoch Train will buy, um, he'll create a company called the Boston and European Steamboat Company to actually enhance the trade between England and America, but he also used his uh, white diamond line to have ships built by Donald McKay like the Flying Cloud, which won the record from sailing from Hong Kong back to, uh, actually in this case, Liverpool, and won by like um, 45 minutes. So McKay is one, of, he's the guy they credit with building the clipper ships, but actually the clipper ship was developed in Baltimore. McKay just improved its lines, made it a longer ship capable of carrying greater loads. And as a result of that, um, it is the a typical or the greatest example of clipper ships. And it was owned by Enoch Train. The panic of 1857 will put him bankrupt and he'll die in 1865. But his steamship company is what had the uh, Enoch Train built as a steam tug with a reinforced bow to be an icebreaker. And so that's how they turned it into the Manassas. Anything else? Uh, yeah, we got one here. Um, so would the capture of New Orleans be considered part of the Mississippi River campaigns under command uh, of uh, General uh, Halleck? Um, actually, no, it was an independent command. George McClellan believed in amphibious operations. So Halleck is really in command of the forces coming down through Tennessee. Uh, and uh, of course, the... Um, Gunboat Squadron uh, will at this time be commanded by Charles Henry Davis. Um, Andrew Foote originally was in command of the Gunboat Squadron, the Ironclad Gunboat Squadron, but he was wounded at the Battle of uh, Fort Donelson and then would die from his wound complications. So uh, it's a different force. However, they will unify once St. or St once New Orleans is captured. Butler will stay in New Orleans. That's how he gets the nickname of the beast because of his women's order, because you know Union soldiers and sailors and officers be walking down the street like Bourbon Street and the ladies would dump their night jar off their balconies right at the same time these guys are walking by. So Butler says, look, if you defame or uh, do anything disrespectful towards union personnel, you, the lady, will be treated like a woman of the streets. That's why Butler is known as Beast Butler. He's the only guy to get his likeness on the bottom of a chamber pot developed during the war. <clears throat> so uh, Farragut will eventually operate up around Vicksburg as the water falls in 62, he goes back down to New Orleans. And then it's a whole nother story, which I'll tell you about, and that will be the Battle of Port Hudson. That's for a later date. Uh, next, um, next month on 10 August, I'm gonna be telling you all about the, the side wheeler, the USS Mississippi that has this amazing career before and during the Civil War. Any other questions? Um, yeah, did any other Confederate armored gunboats or rams use a steam system like the um, like the Manassas? Well, no, they didn't um, because um, they had, this is like the Virginia, it had two boat howitzers at, um, at the end, each end of the casemate so that if they were trying to board, uh, they would be able to repel them with those guns. Um, so no other ship uh, did that. Um, and uh, it was a unique concept, but uh, I would have to say ships like the Arkansas, I mean, they were lucky to have even been built. And, you know, the Arkansas was almost box shape, just like the Louisiana and the Mississippi, the builders of the Mississippi, the Tiff brothers, 
built housing developments. So they said, well, we can build a ship. We'll just build the casemate just like a house. And so that's why you did not have the classic 36% slope. Back on the Albemarle, the slope is 30 inches. That's to bounce off shot. The conical shape of the Manassas also bounced off shots. Okay. Next question. Um, yeah, it looks like we got one more here. Um, who commanded the Brownwater Navy at this time? Was it reporting to Halleck or Butler? No, it reported to Halleck because um, it was an odd setup because at the outbreak of the war, um, James Eads goes to the Navy and says, look, you're going to need gunboats and I can build iron gunboats on the Mississippi River. He develops a design with uh, naval constructor Samuel Pook and uh, but the army pays for their construction they have naval officers to command them so it was a real hodgepodge uh, command <coughs> until 63 when they will actually keep the navy vessels they all become part of the navy and then they are given control the gunboats by the fall of Vicksburg will be commanded by David Dixon Porter, and the overall fleet will be commanded by his foster brother, David Glasgow Farragut. So, um, yeah. So, you know, the Brownwater uh, ships, uh, the Rams, the Ellet Rams, they were all paid for by the U.S. Army because the Navy said, oh, you know, we don't need those. Um, I don't know why they thought that way at first, because they were all used to blue water navies. And to have a brown water navy means a whole different type of ship, which the U.S. Navy will begin creating with the Potomac River Squadron, which will take ferry boats, double enders, and arm them with artillery. Um, and so they feature a great deal in actions on the Chesapeake as well as in the North Carolina Sounds. All right, so it looks like we got one more question here. Time for one more. Uh, this is saying, uh, did Porter attempt to prove the value of his mortar attack anywhere else? Uh, yes, um, he, they will use mortar boats at the attack. Now, not Porter, but it would have been uh, Charles Henry Davis, but they have mortar scows, not schooners, uh, that bombard island number 10, um, and they were, uh, of course, towed into action and then anchored. And you got to realize these mortars uh, weigh, I think it is 42,000 pounds. Okay. It fired a 13 inch shell. And uh, so it was, they were devastating. Island number 10, which I'll talk about some other time, uh, was really a debacle for the Confederacy. In fact, the river defense fleet uh, defending the upper reaches of the Mississippi, uh, such as Natchez and um, Memphis and Island number 10 <clears throat> are just not strong enough because they don't have ironclads. They'll have one ironclad that has a brief heroic career which is another story for another day. So I thank you all so much uh, for um, uh, watching today. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, you can always, uh, I do have a blog that I published <clears throat> about the capture of New Orleans, Farragut's rise to fame. And so I think you can also send me email questions through that system. Uh, and uh, I'll be forward to the emails. So yes, it was a powerful event. I think it doomed the Confederacy with the loss of New Orleans. So until next time, I'm John Korstein, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariner's Museum and Park, which is just a fabulous uh, institution. As you all know, we're going to be doing other blogs, not just myself all the time, uh, but uh, which is very good because the museum has so many fabulous stories to tell. And we've learned that the Zoom uh, um, system is perfect for uh, sharing stories 
of the sea. So until later then, um, just remember always to sink before surrender. Thank you.